Okay, so we're going to be thinking about tensor fields. And in this context, a field is just a function of position. So we're going to be thinking about quantities that depend on some spatial coordinates. And these quantities are tensors. Okay, and this course is all about defining and studying the properties of tensors. So before we're looking at, at tensor fields, um, it's helpful that we first consider what we know about scalar and vector fields. So if we think about a scalar field, so a scalar field, um, let's call it T, and let's consider a Cartesian coordinate system, three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system. Okay, so X, Y, and Z. Um, this scalar field will take the coordinate and throw back a number. Okay, so something with magnitude only. So this could represent, for example, the temperature at every point in a room. Um, and we don't have to use Cartesian coordinates. We could just as well use spherical polar coordinates. So we have an R, a theta, and a phi. And it should be clear to you that the temperature in the room doesn't depend on whether we measure our, um, or we, we set up a Cartesian coordinate system or a spherical polar coordinate system um, to map out the room. Okay, the temperature is independent of that. Um, we can also think about vector fields. And let's call our vector field A. Okay, so I, I draw little arrows, um, sorry, it's an arrow. I draw little arrows above my vectors. And this can take the three x, y, and z coordinates. And at every point in our three-dimensional space, there is a vector. So something with position, sorry, something with magnitude and direction. And equally well, we can describe this vector field in a different coordinate system, for example, our spherical polar system, or theta and phi. Okay, so examples of a scalar field could be the temperature in the room, as, as we said, um, or the image shows the uh, temperature, effectively the temperature at every point on the surface of this house. And a vector field, an example of that could be the velocity of wind at every point in space in a tornado. Okay, so here's an example of um, what a vector field looks like. You have a, a magnitude and direction at each point in space. So we're going to introduce tensors as generalizations of scalars and vectors. Um, but it's first helpful to think a little more about what vectors are. So if I draw a vector, let's call it A. This is vector A. Okay, with an arrow. This vector exists independently of any coordinate system. Okay, this is a, an obvious but important point. So this guy has magnitude and direction. Now we could choose to put a coordinate system on the board. So this is X and Y. And in this two-dimensional coordinate system, let's have basis vectors, so the one along x. Let's call it E1, and let's call the basis vector in the y direction E2. Now, once we choose a coordinate system, we can also write down what the vector A is in the representation um, that's described by this coordinate system. So as you know, you can just uh, construct this vector A as some component, so some component along X, let's call it A superscript one. So this is some, direct, some length along X direction and the x-direction is given by the basis vector E1. Okay, and let's, let's make these unit vectors. 
So there's a hat to make it a unit vector. Um, plus, so we go this much along x, and then we go this much along y. So plus a2, where this component is a superscript 2. So we go a2 up in the direction given by the basis vector e2. Okay, so we've chosen a representation of our vector a. So this is our vector a. And this is our representation of it in this coordinate system. We could just as well have picked a different coordinate system. So let's draw our vector a again. And instead of this xy system, let's rotate that system. So now this is x. Let's call it x bar. That's a new x. And let's call this new y, y bar. And now the basis vectors are different. The ones that point along x bar, let's call them e1 bar. And it's a vector, so it gets an arrow. And the one that points along y, let's call it e2 bar. And it's a vector, so it gets an arrow. Okay. And now this vector can be expressed again in component form, components and basis vectors. But now the basis vectors are different and the components will also be different. So this is now the same vector A described in a new component, A1 bar. So that's the projection of A onto this x-axis. So A1 bar is this length. And A2 bar is this length. So we have our vector A described as a component A1 bar along X bar, which has direction E1 bar. And it's a unit vector, so it's got a hat. So sorry for the um, overly complex notation. And we add to that, so we go a1 bar along, and then we go a2 bar up. So we have a2 bar up in the direction of the basis vector, the point in the direction of y bar. Uh, this is a vector, and it's a unit vector. OK, so we have two different representations of the same vector. So this is our first. And uh, this is our second. And both representations have components, these A1s and A2s. These are the components. So we won't restrict ourselves to three dimensional coordinate systems. Um, instead, we'll consider more general um, coordinate systems in n-dimensional space. And we'll think about the coordinate system that we denote as x1 with the superscript, x2 with the superscript, and the reason for the superscripts will become clear later, up to xn. And this set of coordinates is a general one, and um, it has a name. It's called um, a set of curvilinear coordinates. Um, so examples of curvilinear coordinates are uh, given in the notes, but curvilinear simply means that the coordinate curves um, don't have to be straight, they can be curved. Okay, so the coordinate curves are described um, in the lecture notes. So here we're, we're thinking about um, how we represent scalars, vectors and tensors in this n-dimensional space. 
So if we just generalize what we did before, now we have a scalar field And let's call it t. And now the scalar field depends on all the n coordinates. And it takes the coordinates and throws back a number at every position in that n dimensional space. Okay, and we can think about a vector field in this n dimensional space a, and this takes all the coordinates oops and you get a vector at every point in this n dimensional space so at each point in space a vector field gives us a vector and that vector which we call a so at a specific point in the space can be represented in its component form as follows. So A can be written as A1, the component for the first direction, the first coordinate, and the basis vector for the first coordinate, plus the component for the second coordinate, and the basis vector for the second coordinate, plus um, up to the last component, AN, and the basis vector for the last coordinate, EN. So note that once you've chosen a coordinate system, um, with the coordinate system you get the basis vectors, and then your vector is described by n components, the a1 to the an. So you can think of a vector field as um, being described by n components, so n to the power of 1, which equals n components. For a scalar field, at each point in our n-dimensional space, we have a single number. So in terms of components, this is n to the power of 0, which is one component. We can generalize to tensors. And a tensor is an object that can be described um, in terms of n to the power of r components, Okay, where r is the rank of the tensor. Okay, so a scalar field has rank 0, a vector field has rank 1. Okay, so rank 0, rank 1. Okay, but tensors are more general, so R can be greater than 2. Um, so if we consider a rank 2 tensor, then the number of components required is n squared. Okay, and you've, you've come across some rank 2 tensors before, maybe without realizing, but if you think about a body rotating, then the angular momentum, so if you've done some classical mechanics, the angular momentum L is given by I, the moment of inertia, with the angular velocity vector. But this I, this moment of inertia, it's a matrix. Um, and a matrix is just a rank 2 tensor. So this moment of inertia tensor, it relates the angular velocity, which is something that points in one direction, to the angular momentum, which is something that can point in a different direction. So I has to have information about more than one direction. So whilst the scalar has just a magnitude at each point in space, a vector has magnitude and one direction at each point in space, you can think about tensors as having um, magnitude and multiple directions at each point in space. Okay, but we'll come back to a more mathematically rigorous definition in the next few lectures.